Good morning or afternoon, whenever you're seeing this. Mr. Walker here dropping the knowledge on the space race and the Cuban Missile Crisis of the Cold War. It is about to get heated and very scary. All right, so let's take a look. All right, things I want students to know or be able to do, explain how the space race helped technology but made the world less safe, explain how the space race was a way of establishing power through money, and then uh, understand the Bay of Pigs invasion, the events that led up to the Cuban Missile Crisis, be able to ex explain each step of that, understand the idea of brinksmanship and uh, how that can be good or bad, identify who's involved in this Cuban Missile Crisis, and then understand how the conflict got resolved. All right, so essential questions, how did the space race change the scope of the Cold War and how did the Cuban Missile Crisis change the scope of the war? So here's kind of a step uh, by step of the space race. As you can kind of see, if you take a look at it, uh, we beat the Russians to have the first man to orbit the moon and then we have the first person to land on the moon. Other than that, the Russians kind of, or the Soviets beat us to everything, all right? First satellite, first animal, first person. Okay, um, first person, I think, in orbit. Uh, and so they, they beat us on a lot of things. And so, uh, as you recall, they launched Sputnik, uh, artificial satellite, into space. You know, Americans are shocked. We start pouring money into our own space program and education uh, because we don't want to be outdone by the communists. Also, does this thing have cameras? Can they look at us? Can they hear us? Um, you know, they now have rocket capability of launching something into space, so can they launch a rocket at us? Um, you know, what is the full capabilities of this and we need to get it going. So if you were, you know, if you're a college student in the 50s after Sputnik, if you're going into science or math, the government was going to probably pay for your education. Um, shortly though after Sputnik, we would launch our first uh, satellite into orbit, uh, all right, Explorer 1. But what this does is this sets up our uh, capability of launching intercontinental ballistic missiles. What these are are rockets that can hit anywhere in the world. And then at the top cone of them would be uh, a nuclear warhead or multiple nuclear warheads so that we can bomb anywhere in the world from our, the United States. You know, these are all potential nuclear attacks. These big red dots, this is where we keep our... Uh, our atomic bombs, okay, and so the people would want to attack those, but we have a lot of them. See, you can see all the different silos between Nebraska, Wyoming, and Colorado area, all right? This is a MERV, a multiple independent re-entry vehicle. The re-entry means it goes into space and then it comes back down into Earth uh, before it hits its target. On top of it are these uh, cone things. Uh, but these cones are all nuclear warheads. So you can see there's multiple in one. This uh, particular one actually happens to have, I believe, eight. All right, so we can attack with eight different nuclear attacks at once on an intercontinental ballistic missile. We call them peacekeepers. Uh, we are not allowed to use them. I believe we signed a treaty with Russia or with the Soviet Union later on that says, I believe we can only carry three nuclear warheads on top of an intercontinental ballistic. But the idea is it goes up and then once it reaches such a height, it drops the nuclear warheads and we have eight different explosions at once. Eight nuclear attack at once, that's not good. What this leads to is what we call MAD. All right, mutually assured destruction. If you kill me, I will kill you. All right, if you launch one, I will launch all 10. So, uh, and then, you know, both, or not 10, but like all 1,000, you know, and then the other side's gonna launch 1,000. So, the idea behind mutually assured destruction is, you know, if either side's gonna start a nuclear war, both are going to be destroyed. So, if both are gonna be destroyed, nobody wants to have a nuclear war, okay? So we, uh, so that's kind of the beginning of the space race and how that impacts our nuclear. But uh, what, getting people into space, as I said, the Soviets beat us with Yuri Gagarin. Uh, he's going to be the first man in the space. He's considered a Soviet hero. It's actually going to save him on another uh, mission where the Soviets actually have a very bad uh, spaceship. What they wanted to do is launch a spaceship, launch another one the next day, and then dock them together. Uh, on the anniversary of communism taking over the Soviet Union the show, as like a show of power. Uh, Garrigan was supposed to be on that ship. Uh, well, he was going to be the next in line, but he also said the ship was not 
you know, it couldn't go in the space. It wasn't going to be good enough. Uh, the Soviets still sent somebody up in that spaceship, and the guy ended up dying when trying to come back to Earth. So he was kind of saved by his friend. It's kind of crazy that, you know, it was a at all cost kind of a thing, knowing that people were going to die. Um, later, uh, in February of 1962, America gets their first uh, astronaut, John Glenn, to orbit the Earth, okay? Um, and then by 1969, U.S. astronaut Neil Armstrong is the first one to land on the moon. That kind of became our only thing that we could beat them at, okay? So July 20th, 1969, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We were able to get two people onto the moon. Um, in the United States, we watched it on, uh, well, people at home watched it on their TVs. You know, we have more technology in our cell phones today than they do in those spaceships that got them to the moon, um, which is really crazy to think about. What is such an, a great uh, achievement back then. We further develop our, uh, our space and our space program to help shoot down nuclear weapons, okay? Um, and we refer to this as Star Wars, but it was called SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative. What this was, it was a, a laser-based space uh, uh, protection against intercontinental ballistics. So if, say, uh, the Soviet Union was going to launch their nuclear weapons at us, we would have lasers either on the ground or up in space, and they would bounce off mirrors and then shoot those down when they're up in space. It wouldn't cause a nuclear explosion because that's not how it happens. Uh, um, we would just end up shooting their missiles down, okay? Um, and so, you know, you can take a look. It's very futuristic, you know, it's lasers in space, like boom, blowing things up. It costed a lot of money. The United States spent a lot of money on this. However, it never comes to, it never, never happens. We, we started it. We started building things for it. Um, but really what we were trying to do is get the Soviets to spend money on theirs too, because the space race just wasn't about who could make it in the space. It was, you know, part of the Cold War is this uh, battle of ideas. You know, who, how do you win the war when you can't shoot, fight, or bomb? Well, it's a battle of ideas, and our idea was to get into space. Well, um, as we're developing better and better space technology, the Soviets are trying to keep up with us as well at the same time. The only difference is we have the money through capitalism to keep this going to be able to spend money on this, whereas the Soviets have to spend more of their money. They don't make as much as us. So they're going broke trying to chase us, and that was kind of the thing here. This also extremely scared the Soviet Union. They were extremely scared of SDI, or what becomes known as Star Wars. Um, they were. They thought that for sure, if we were able to develop this, they we would have a direct upper hand against them. All right, and then that moves us to the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay, so in 1962, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay, uh, we had nuclear bombs in Turkey. Turkey is. Uh, right underneath the Soviet Union, okay? So we were friends with Turkey. They let us put nuclear weapons in their country, and then we pointed them at the Soviet Union, right? The new leader of uh, the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, kind of made this statement like, how would you like it if we had missiles in your backyard and pointed them at you, okay? So, um, well, Cuba, Cuba becomes a communist country, and of course the communist countries align together in the Soviet Union being the most powerful, okay? Um, you know, and Cuba's only 104 miles from Key West, or like 90 miles, 90 to 104 miles away from Key West. Key West, the lowest uh, American territory closest to that. So just to give you a reference, that's like, you know, from Madison to Chicago area, or even less than. Well, when the, so, or when the communists take over Cuba with Fidel Castro as their leader, uh, the United States isn't too happy about that. That's a really close communist country. So one of the things, uh, you know, Fidel Castro takes over, he seizes U.S. properties because remember Cuba, if you remember from your eighth grade education, Cuba we got from the Spanish in the Spanish-American War when we defeated the Spanish. And so we had Cuba as a, a territory. However, we let the Cubans rule themselves. We kind of left them up to, gave, pretty much gave them their country, but we had some of our own property on there. When the communists take over Cuba and they take our U.S. properties, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, cuts off diplomatic relationships. He's, not, he's like, we're not talking. Um, in fact, we're not trading, we're not talking, we're not visiting each other. To this day, 
um, you know, President Obama changed it, but I think it was changed by the Trump administration where, um, you know, in 2016, I believe, Obama made it so that we could visit Cuba because Cuba is a tourist uh, country. Um, and then we had some baseball games down there. However, like, we're still not in good relationship with Cuba to this day, 60 years later, you know. Um, we don't trade with them. 10% uh, of the Cuban population goes into exile. Those are, you know, your your capitalists, your business owners, um, and then they come to the United States. The United States had an idea of overthrowing the uh, the Fidel Castro and the communists. It was called the Bay of Pigs. We took all those Cuban exiles, we trained them for combat, and then we sent them back to Cuba as an attempt to overthrow uh, Fidel Castro. Well, it goes terribly wrong. Uh, the exiles are either killed on the beaches or taken prisoner. So to pay them back, JFK has to pay ransom in the form of food and medicine. So think about how poor Cuba is as starting out as a country when they don't want money. They want food and medicine because they don't have that or have enough of it for their people. Okay, so that's something to think about when you're thinking about communism is they didn't ransom, ransom these people they took prisoner for money or for something bigger. No, they did it for food and medicine. All right, so JFK is the president at the time of the Bay of Pigs, although he didn't plan this. It's a very big embarrassment for the United States. Um, so we, and you know, Cuba wants to protect itself from the United States. They think that we're going to invade them because we did that. We train these Cuban exiles. So we start flying these U-2 planes. These are spy planes with uh, cameras in the nose. And what we notice is it appears that they are setting up missile launches for uh, intermediate and medium range uh, nuclear missiles. Okay. And so we see this. And this is very clear that there are nuclear rockets underneath here. Okay. So Nikita Khrushchev actually sent these weapons to Cuba to kind of protect Cuba. Um, Right, and JFK sees them and he warns the Soviet Union, if you attack us, we will be all out nuclear war. So this mad that I talked about earlier, uh, he's totally planning for it. And these medium range uh, missiles can hit, you know, all the way up here to Washington, D.C. And then the intermediate ones can hit all the way up here. So the only safe place was this like West Coast part. They could have hit anywhere in the United States from Cuba. All right. So. JFK has two options. He could order an airstrike on the missiles site and destroy it, but that would probably lead to an all-out nuclear warfare with the USSR or the Soviet Union, and we wouldn't be here today. So instead, what he decides to do is he sets up a naval blockade. The Navy surrounds Cuba, okay? Nothing in, nothing out, but for six days, uh, you know, we told the Soviets that if they brought their ships with more supplies, because they were still sending their ships, um, we will sink their ships, okay? And so the ships keep coming, actually. So we surrounded Cuba with our uh, ships, and, you know, we're not letting anything else in. And the Soviet ships keep coming, keep coming, and we tell them if you're going to cross the line, we, you will be fired at, you will be sunk. One does cross the line. We do fire at it. It goes over the top of the ship and hits the water on purpose. We, it's kind of like a warning shot. And then the Soviet ship stopped. <laughs> um, I got to really stress that this is a crazy time in the world. Like the world was holding its breath thinking that we were going to blow each other up. And it came very, very close. Uh, President or, uh, Robert Kennedy, President Kennedy's brother, uh, secretly met with the Soviets um, and we came to an agreement. Khrushchev agreed to remove the missiles uh, from, the, from Cuba if the United States does not invade. We shook hands and boom. Privately, we agreed, the United States agreed, to remove our missiles from Turkey. However, the rest of the world does not know that. The rest of the world just knows that we, we agreed not to invade Cuba and so Khrushchev removes the missiles. That is a black eye to Khrushchev because it looks like he lost. He had to give up more than we had to give up. So we won world prestige. He lost world prestige. Okay, but it became, it was very, very intense. All right, this is the closest the world has ever come to nuclear warfare. Um, and Kennedy was criticized for practicing what is called brinksmanship, where you're on the brink, like just press the button. You can see him there uh, arm wrestling here about to push the buttons. Okay, however, he was praised for his cool leadership, his collective head, and he took a, a different uh, path to this. But make no mistakes, like we, we, this was extremely, extremely close. Both countries sat there with our fingers, just like in this picture, with our fingers hovering above that button. If something was to go down, it was all out nuclear warfare. But luckily, President Kennedy chose the naval uh, quarantine or the naval blockade and 
uh, we talked it out and the leaders prevailed. So uh, th this was really close, though. This could have ended in uh, nuclear warfare. And that is all I have. Thank you.